there's been an accident and you find yourself lying at the side of the road with a broken leg. You cry out for help. What kind of helper do you want? Uh, one man stops and comes over growling and complaining, some people are just too much. I don't have time for this. As you decided pain in the neck, making me waste my time. It sound attractive to you? Like somebody who's going to grump his way all the way through whatever he does for you? Or perhaps it's the car that stops and a person runs over to take a look and starts to dash back to his car for his first aid kit and slips and steps on your broken leg. And I think that's a good a choice. Or uh, a skilled medical doctor pulls up at the side of the road and says, sure, I'll help. I can fix you right up. I'll have a check for $5,000 in advance, please. Today, we're going to read Ruth chapter 3, and we'll see Boaz as a figure of Christ, an image of Christ, an example of the Old Testament Goel or kinsman redeemer, close redeemer who helps people. Let's turn with me to Ruth 3. And uh, we'll read the whole chapter. Then we'll focus on the first verses, or the middle verses, really, from verse 6 on. Listen to God's word. Then Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? That's that Hebrew word goel. We'll talk about what that means later. In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the thrashing floor. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Put on your best garment and go down to the thrashing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies. And you shall go in, uncover his feet and lie down. And he will tell you what you should do. And she said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. So she went down to the thrashing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? So she, she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative to you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. Lie down till morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, and she arose before one could recognize another. Then he said, Do not let it be known that the woman came to the thrashing floor. Also he said, Bring the shawl that is on you and lay it and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. So when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her. And she said, These six ephahs of barley he gave me. For he said to me, Do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Then she said, Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. Boel is here is that image of a, he's an image of Christ. He's the the Goel, the kinsman redeemer. In the Jewish law, it was specified that under circumstances, one of the close kin of somebody in trouble had rights to help him. We'll get into details later. Clearly, as you look at what we just read, Boaz is a picture to us of what Christ was to be. 
also an example of what we should be, but we won't focus on that in this, at this point. He shows you the kind of help that Christ gives. He shows you the kind of help that you need. Last time, that's three years ago now, so you've all forgotten, I'm sure. <laughs> we saw how you should seek shelter in Christ. Ruth's coming to Boaz for that. We saw there was a twofold need to be redeemed from your poverty and to be married to Christ. And like Ruth did before Boaz, you should humble yourself before the Lord of glory. You should recognize his greatness. You should appreciate and recognize your own unworthiness. You approach Christ as your kinsman redeemer. You come to him with trust. You come to him for redemption. You seek him to be your husband. Ruth throughout shows us how to deal with hard choices. It starts with the reality that choices which move you away from God bring bitterness, as Ruth's mother-in-law and Elimelech, her husband, they moved away from Israel because times were tough and they just got trouble for it. It goes on to show that choosing God leads to great reward. Today we want to see the attractiveness of choosing God. We're looking at the redeemer you need. Go back to that first question I asked you. You want a redeemer who welcomes you? You want a redeemer who protects you? You want a redeemer who provides for you? These three things. First, a redeemer who welcomes you. We look at Boaz and Ruth. So they're laid out for us here as the examples and pictures. Boaz, uh, night his harvest was coming to an end and he had a great pile of wheat there or grain whatever he was harvesting his barley at this point and he lay down comfortably to rest on them when he, everything was done in the evening and he woke up in the middle of the night and there was a woman lying at his feet in the dark he didn't have a clue who she might be so he's not surprising he was startled wouldn't you be so he said who are you and she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. And that close relative is that word goel I mentioned. It comes all through this passage. The goel in God's law is the relative who has the right to rescue a person in trouble. A, perhaps somebody has had to sell themselves into slavery to pay their debts. Something that happened in that time. And the Goel had the right to buy them back out of the slavery and redeem them. A relative might have had to sell their property to pay their debts. And for the Jews, the property was a tangible symbol that God gave them a permanent inheritance. It was not to be taken away from them. And losing their property was a bad thing in a deep sense for them. It came close to having to give up God. And the Goel was the person who had the right to come and say, here's the money for that property and give it back to the original owner, the one who had received it from God's hand earlier. The Goel here also picks up the theme in the books of Moses that, uh, of preserving the family line, the, the family name as a sign of, um, of our permanent inheritance with Christ. And if somebody died, a man died without a child, then his brother was to take that man's wife and take her as his wife, and the first child would be his brother's child. They continue the brother's family line, even though he's gone. The Goel is the person assigned by God to return somebody who is in trouble to freedom, to the ability to sustain himself in God's hand, land, to have the visible mark of God's promise in his hand and upon him. And Ruth came to Boaz and called him that. She was making a heavy duty request for help. She asked him to act as Goel to her and to Naomi and that meant first that he should marry Ruth. When she said, take your maidservant under your wing, or as some translations read, to take your maidservant under the corner of your garment. In the idiom of that time, 
That meant, take me under your protection. And in that context, as she addressed him as her Goel, it was clear that she meant he should take her under his protection by marrying her. Now, as far as I know, it was just as unusual then as it is now for a woman to ask a man to marry her. It was normal the other way around, but uh, it, this is a special case because a family line is threatened and this is a, there's a need here that is special. He is uh, responsible to deal in that. And Ruth, Boaz knew that, but of course he saw other things too. He recognized that it was flattering that she should choose him instead of a younger man. But there's more to her request than simple marriage as we think of it. That wouldn't be such a big deal. It's a, something of a big deal, but she asked, go, bo, go, she asked Boaz as her goel to marry her. That meant she asked him to act as a substitute for her husband who has died. That meant he would have to buy back her father-in-law Elimelech's land for Naomi, her mother-in-law. Uh, spent his good money on land for another person and no doubt a fair bit of money. And then not only that, but they, their first child, their first son, would have to be passed on to Naomi to be her son to replace her dead sons to continue that family line. Now you add all that up together. And uh, you can say Ruth is not your commonplace beggar asking for a, a meal or even a week's groceries, isn't she? Hardly surprising then if Boaz had answered with a no, which rang from Bethlehem all the way to Jerusalem. Don't you think? It wouldn't be surprising if he called his servants and said, toss this woman off my property and keep her away forever. But he didn't. He didn't. In fact, he blessed her for making that request. Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. Verse 10. Clearly, he welcomed her request. He didn't consider it an imposition. Rather, it was something for which to honor her, to bless her. She'd shown a, a love or kindness which goes beyond the ordinary. And the word used for that love or kindness depending on your translation, literally is, is the word that is used for covenant faithfulness. It's not just, I love you, you're nice, but it's, I love in the sense that I am going to be faithful to you in a long-term commitment. Her kindness at the beginning presumably refers to her commitment to Naomi. You know how Ruth when Naomi decided to go back to Israel and they had nothing. Elimelech had died and Naomi's sons had died and Naomi and the two daughters-in-law were left alone. And Naomi said, there's nothing here for us. I'm going back to my home. You go back to your families and let them care for you. And Ruth refused. Ruth said, I'm going with you. Your, your home will be my home. Your Lord, your God will be my God. That choice to stay with Naomi and choose Naomi's God, he recognized as the mark of a kind heart, a good heart. Now it's even clearer as she takes steps to provide, not just provide for herself, but to provide for Naomi as well. Ruth could probably have found a prosperous young man, somebody who looked good, you know, to marry, somebody who's close to her age. But that would not have restored Naomi's covenant hope in God. Some prosperous young man did not have a right to buy that property back for Naomi. She needed Ruth to wed someone from Elimelech's family if she was to get the land back. And Ruth was willing to do that. So 
He speaks of her kindness at the end being even greater. It's covenant love. It's covenant faithfulness to Naomi. It's also an act of honor and blessing to Boaz. He welcomed her, turning to him. Now, what does that say about Christ and us? Well, it's a picture. You are invited. Indeed, you are commanded to come to Christ. The great commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your strength and all your mind and all your soul. You shall totally, with all your being, love God. It's a command. Nobody is exempted. There is nobody who can say, well, that command was for your friend here, but it wasn't for you. If anybody tells you that not everybody is invited to Christ, and we have Christians who think that, remind them that everybody is commanded to come to him. It's not just that there's an invitation, which may be for some and not for others. There's a command for all of us. Now, it might appear that you should be very unwelcome. Sin makes you an enemy of God. Sin shows you to be an ungrateful recipient of all the many good gifts he's poured out on you. And in this land, we are so overloaded with gifts that we say, we don't need God anymore. We've got everything. Isn't that right? You forget where they come from. You know, who wants to give again to one who's shown himself to be ungrateful? But Christ welcomes you the same way that Boaz welcomed Ruth. Specifically, Jesus invites sinners to come to him. He invites rebels to come to him. He says, while you were enemies, I died for you. Romans 5. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do people who have done nothing wrong have to repent? No. It's sinners who have to repent. And only sinners. So Jesus is saying to sinners, turn away from your sin and come to me which is what repent means. He's addressing sinners specifically. At one point he says the good don't need a savior. Not that any of us reach that, but that's the thing. Jesus, when he calls sinners to himself, then you know that your sin does not make you unwelcome. And you know, there is rejoicing in heaven when people obey that command. Luke 15, 7, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Take that very seriously. Note what brings special joy in heaven. It's not that God doesn't treasure the obedience of his people, the goodness of the 99, that. Perfect obedience would certainly bring joy in heaven, no question. But to see one person turn from darkness to light, from death to life, that is the cause of great joy. It's not surprising, unusual. You see it in the media all the time. You you read an obituary for somebody who's accomplished a great deal, uh, well-known politician who's done some good things or whatever it may be, and you'll see the obituary and all kinds of people tossing in articles and letters and good things that they remember about that person. It's great. Somebody is uh, revived by a heart transplant when they're clinically dead, and it likely makes the headlines, right? Perhaps it's more commonplace now, not so much so, but it's way more. Life is much more important than good deeds. 
in this sense. So God welcomes those who come to Christ. He gives them new life, and there is joy in heaven because of it. He gladly receives those who bind themselves to him in covenant faithfulness. He gives them life. Of course, if we see clearly, we realize that it was God who drew us to make that commitment. John 6, is just one of the places where God tells us that, that we come to him because he called us, he drew us, he gave us the grace to turn to him. He wanted us. He welcomes us as Boaz welcomed Ruth, a redeemer who welcomes you. You also want a redeemer who protects you. And Boaz shows us that in some small things, but they're significant. As he spoke to Ruth there in the middle of the night, he told Ruth to stay where she was through the night. Stay in a place of safety under his protection. He was there and his servant sleeping around, you know, and he was safe there. As she headed home through the night, who knew what she might run into? And then he sent her home quietly before it was quite light. And he told his servants to keep quiet about it. He didn't want people to hear that she had spent her night with Boaz. You know what kind of stories might have gone around like that. If that was heard and circulated. Nobody, all they knew was she'd been there with boys through the night, you know, and you know, can hardly imagine what damage that might do to her reputation in the community. Boaz took care to guard Ruth, to guard her against potential attackers, to guard her against wagging tongues, as we'll see in a moment, to guard her against hunger. And again, he's a picture of what Christ would be for us. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will protect you from all danger. Above all, he protects you from spiritual danger. He guards you against the enemies you can't fight, Satan and his hosts, your own inner lusts. And he stands there to guard you. In uh, John 6, he says, The one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. This is the will of the Father who sent me that of all that he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. If God has given you to Christ, you've come to Christ. Christ is not going to let Satan touch you in any way that will take you away from him or your lusts or whatever it may be. He will keep you from falling permanently away from him. He'll also guard you from physical dangers. There's no trouble, no trial, which will be allowed to come to you unless Christ has a good purpose for you and his church through it. The classic case is Joseph. You remember Joseph, how Joseph was a bit of a snob, thought highly of himself, but uh, his brothers got really upset at him and uh, sold him into slavery to get rid of him. Of course, Joah, Joseph, you remember, if you remember the story, eventually became the prime minister of Egypt with only Pharaoh having any authority over him. Highest place he could possibly have in that land. And later, his brothers, when they were brought back together, his brothers came to him in fear, asking for forgiveness. Do you remember Joseph's response? He said, you meant it to me for evil, but God meant it to me for good so that I could be here to rescue you and my father in this time of famine. God had a good purpose for the pain and suffering that Joseph went went through. These things happen but we are protected. Despite this reality of trials we face, you have in Christ a Redeemer who protects you in love, who will not let you fall. And then you want a Redeemer who provides for you. And there's Ruth, who's surviving by picking up uh, bits and pieces of grain falling 
in the fields as they harvest. You want that kind of life? Sounds pretty tough to me. They don't have anything, really. And she was sent home with food in her hand. She didn't ask for that. It, you could say it was, went with what she asked, but she was giving herself into the hands of Boaz, but she didn't ask for food. But Boaz was not content just to promise her help. And in fact, he said, I may not be able to be the one who helps you because there's another one who has first choice. And I have to allow that. He's a closer kinsman. He's the first go well, as it might be. But he wasn't going to let her go home empty-handed. He showed an action that he was willing to help, that he was there to help. He put six measures of barley into her shawl. The Hebrew text doesn't specify what measure was used, but the context and the ability and the uh, ability to carry it suggests the sia. The New Testament, New King James ephah is way too big. No, she wouldn't have been able to carry that. Nor would, it, nor would it fit in her shawl. One commentator observes that six sias would be a full load, about 40 kilograms of barley, a generous gift. And you can say, well, that's, there's no way she's going to carry 88 pounds, 40 kilograms of barley in her shawl. But you do have to remember that in those days, all people, particularly women, had to engage in much harder physical labor than virtually any of us do today. So people build up more muscles through that. In any case, the, the measure isn't really important. What we have is a large quantity of grain enough to keep them for a long time ahead. And that gift was a sign of his commitment and more because it was also a sign of God's love and God's care. As another commentator said, the six measures of barley served as a sign to Naomi that her time of emptiness was past. She came home, if you remember, saying, don't call me Naomi because Naomi means blessed and I am not anymore. <coughs> And here again, Boaz shows you how our Lord deals with you. You come to him and he cares for you. And there's no charge for his service. You don't have to have a ticket. You don't have to have a, a, a check in hand or anything like that. That's a good thing because you can't buy peace with God. You can only come to him as a beggar as Ruth did to Boaz. You have no coins to offer which have any value in God's kingdom. What does he need with coins? You know, money, what's that? It's a token for us of how we exchange services and goods, but it has no value in itself. It's no value to God at all. There are no services which God needs. There's nothing you or I or all of us together or everybody in the whole world together can do that God needs. Remember the beginning of this world. God said, let there be light, and the universe was full of light. You know, somebody who can do that doesn't need anything. He can have what he wants. God doesn't need any services from you, though he, after he redeems you, he gives you services to perform. It's not because he needs them. It's for you to do so that you may join in bringing glory to his name. If Jesus Christ charged us for his help, you and I wouldn't be able to afford it. How much would somebody have to be paid to die for you? Die painfully for you. Die shamefully for you. And Jesus died not just for you or me, but for every person who would believe in him down through all creations. And he didn't just, it wasn't just a matter of physical death stepping place. He took the whole weight of God's eternal anger on himself for us in that death. We couldn't pay for it. But his redemption comes to us free of charge. It's a gift from God, a gift of grace. And he gives you all you need. 
He doesn't just cleanse your guilt. He does that. As we saw a previous time, he comes to you as a husband. And a good husband, so far as he's able, delights to give his wife all she needs. He's pleased to give her gifts. And Jesus does this for his bride, the church. He tells us we're his bride. And there's nothing beyond his ability. He never forgets. A couple of days ago, a few days ago, Lois and I were sitting at the table at noon and, hmm, just re- re- remembered together that it was our anniversary that day. We'd forgotten, both of us. Jesus doesn't forget. When there's a need, he knows it, and he knows when it needs to be settled. And he can do what he pleases. There are only two limits on what Jesus gives to his people. He won't give you something that's harmful. If you ask for bread, he won't give you a snake, using the illustration he used in Matthew. And often he waits for you to ask. James 4, 2, James says you don't have because you haven't asked. Does, he does that so you may learn to depend on him. If he just gives it to you, you say, well, it's just, it happened to work out nicely that way. That's good. If you have to ask, then you know it comes from him. Our Lord Jesus delights to give us every good gift. Now, brothers and sisters and friends here, isn't that the kind of redeemer you need? Someone who welcomes you when you come to him, who's never too tired to receive you, who doesn't scorn your weakness, who doesn't find your guilt so repulsive he can't bear to come near you, but is willing and able to receive you, to make you clean, to pay himself the price of your redemption. A redeemer who will protect you. There are terrible threats, terrible attackers running around in this world, seeking to pull you down. You need somebody willing and able to guard you. And Christ takes on that work when you look to him. A redeemer who provides for your needs. There are many who will offer to provide for you and say, do this for me and I'll give you everything you want. Satan will certainly offer you anything to get you to serve him. But none besides Jesus are able to do these things. He is the only healer of disease. Others may claim the credit, but he is the healer. He may work through gifts which people in our society have and hone and study and develop, but he's the one who brings healing in the end. He's the only one who provides material resources for you. The check which your boss gives you, where did he get it? It all comes back to Christ. He's provided for us. And he's the only one who can answer your spiritual needs. As you look at this, there's a serious, big question. Have you put your trust in Christ? Have you faced the fact that you are in desperate need and that he's the one who you need to help help you, help you and turn to him and say, be my Lord, be my Savior, take me and keep me? If you haven't come to him now, come as Ruth did, asking him for big help. Don't come asking him for a penny here. Ask him for the whole bit. Salvation. Come to the Savior who wants you, who's always willing to receive you. Come and find life. And if you're already Christ's, draw near to him, draw closer to him, look to him, realize how much He's there for you. Rejoice in the riches of his care for you and follow his example of love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being there and welcoming us even though we are 
unattractive to say the least, undeserving, repulsive if we saw with a kind of vision you have, ungrateful, but you welcome us. Thank you. You protect us. Protect us from the dangers we don't even see as well as the dangers that come. You hold us when we pass through the rivers or through the fires. You hold us. And in the end, we come out in your hand. You provide for us. Everything we have comes from you. We thank you, Lord. And grant us the grace to hold that awareness of how much you do for us, how wonderful you are in our hearts and delight to draw near to you. And Father, if there are some here who have not yet turned to you, touch their hearts now and help them to see their need and to see that there is no one like you who will welcome them and keep them and provide for them and draw them to Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. Lord, grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen.